Hear these words from John 20, 24 through 31. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I won't believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Patty uh, got me going this morning with her Alabama accent. And she didn't know it when, we were, when, I, when she did that, but I'm actually talking about my native state as well today. And I grew up in and am a native of Missouri. And uh, while Missouri is known for many things, such as Mark Twain, um, or T.S. Eliot, or even J.C. Penney, or Walt Disney. Uh, if anyone's proficient at state nicknames, they'll know that Missouri is often called the Show Me State. So Missourians have apparently been known for their demand to be shown proof. And so while the origins of this nickname are unsure, many attribute the saying from a line of Congressman William Van Diver's speech in 1899, which stated, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton, cockleburs and Democrats, and frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I'm from Missouri, and you have got to show me. So basically, saying I'm from Missouri really just means I'm skeptical and not easily convinced. And what else would you expect from a state that shows a stubborn mule as its state animal? Perhaps Thomas, who we'll be talking about today, would have fit in well in the show me state. Still, even for a person from the show me state, there are things I believe that I cannot see and cannot be shown. And it seems to be the case that almost all of the most important parts of our existence as humans are nearly always invisible. We believe in love which binds our relationships together, even though it's something we cannot see and cannot touch, and it's not easily proven. There are things we believe without touching or seeing. And as a wise person once said, people who can't believe without seeing are desperately limited in all of their relationships. We believe without seeing, and that is a blessing. And while we don't always recognize it or acknowledge it, the four gospel accounts by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written to specific audiences at various points in time and were meant to address different issues surrounding Jesus and his followers. John was most likely written last, and it was done at a time when Jesus' first generation of followers were beginning to die out. The people who had physically seen and touched and experienced Jesus were passing away and going home to God. And the second and third generations were grappling with the question of what it meant for them to follow Jesus, whom they had never seen or met. John, one of the few remaining who knew Christ, had to help these newer generations understand how they could not only believe in Christ, but know him as present in their circumstances. If the Gospel of John was a catchy song, it might sound like the song by Journey, Don't Stop Believin'. This theme continues on when the same John wrote the letter we've called 1 John, which Patty read for us. In 1 John 1, 1 through 4, John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which 
we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John wants to pass on the faith for people who have not seen and have not touched. John wanted these new generations to join in their fellowship of people who know Jesus. And this fellowship isn't just with people who've seen and touched, it's with the Father and with the Son. And so the things that Jesus does and says and the things John records are done in order that these new generations may believe. The question John was trying to wrestle with, how can I believe and know Christ today, even though I never physically knew him, is just as relevant and important for us in this room as it was for those second and third generations of Christ followers. How do we trust a Jesus that we've never shaken hands with? How do we believe in a risen Lord that we've never seen? And whether you're 13 or 93, these are questions that you've undoubtedly wrestled with at one point or another. And all of this leads us to the Apostle Thomas. Thomas helps us sift through these issues of how we know and recognize Christ today. But before we get much further, I think we should acknowledge the elephant in the room. We've treated Thomas pretty unfairly all these years with his nickname, Doubting Thomas. Let me remind you that other people in the Bible have done far worse and received no flack from us. We don't say denying Peter or backstabbing Judas, and we don't talk about murdering Moses. But still, we have Doubting Thomas. We should probably just leave this poor guy alone. So let's agree on his behalf to drop the whole doubting part of his name once and for all. Thomas is so much more than a doubter. He is the one who earlier in the Gospel of John, said, who said to the other disciples when they feared for Jesus' life, Come, let us go to Jerusalem so that we may die with him. Thomas was ready to go all the way to the end with Jesus. And additionally, church tradition, which isn't recorded in the Bible, but is the history and story maintained by the ancient church, teaches that the Apostle Thomas made it all the way to India, where he shared the gospel and started a church there. He is so much more than a doubter. And if anything, scripture and tradition show that he was possibly one of the most faith-filled disciples. It's also pretty unfair of us to give Thomas a hard time about wanting a closer examination of Jesus' body to see proof before he'd believe the words of the other disciples. In his place, I think we would have all done the same thing. If your friends came to you and said, our other friend who was dead isn't dead anymore, we might all be a little skeptical. Is that fair? Thomas's response is a natural response to such outlandish claims. I mean, one of the unspoken narratives of our culture is that something is only worth believing if it has proof. In Thomas's place, I think we would have said the same thing. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. It's sensible, it's rational, and it's also not something that Jesus looks down upon. And I think that's important. Jesus' response to Thomas's request is not one of condescension or shame. He offers to Thomas what he offered to the other disciples just a handful of verses before, a chance to touch and know that Jesus, in fact, came back from the dead. And this leads to the first full confession of who Jesus really is in, God, in the Gospel of John by any person. Perceptive Thomas in response to witnessing and experiencing Jesus' resurrected body, says, My Lord and my God. This is the first time that anyone in John's gospel has called Jesus God, even if they've called him Lord. Thomas recognizes that Jesus is not only alive, 
but he gives us a glimpse into Jesus' full nature as being God, which has been the point that John's been working towards in his whole gospel since he, the prologue where he wrote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Thomas's confession is the bookend to John's prologue, where people finally realize the fullness of who Jesus is. In the first chapter of John, John says that Jesus was in the world, and the world came into being through him, but the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Even though the world didn't recognize him, didn't understand him, and largely rejected him, Thomas, the disciple we've called the doubtful one, knew that Jesus had not just risen from the dead, but was in fact God, because he had seen Jesus. And in response to Thomas's confession, Jesus says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So here we are, the people who have not seen. We are blessed if we believe. All that John wrote was written so that we would believe and choose to enter into the kind of life that Christ knows, that knows Christ as present to us in daily life. One of my favorite writers, Dallas Willard, says this about knowing Christ today. To know him in your world now is to live interactively with him right where you are in your daily activities. This is the spiritual life in Christ. He is, in fact, your contemporary, and he is now about his business of moving humanity along toward its destiny in this amazing universe. You don't want to miss out on being a part, your part, of that great project. This is what the blessing of believing in Christ without having seen him is. He is with us, working alongside us, present to us, swiftly and silently moving history along towards its goal, humanity's glorious redemption. And we have a choice. Will we believe? Will we know Christ and join him in his work in the world? Or will we let this opportunity pass us by? Jesus is present in the world today. And for those of us who have not seen, have not heard, and have not touched, how do we perceive his presence? How can we know him today? We all have the option, and we all have the choice. Dallas Willard continues on to say, to come to know him and to clarify who he really is, people only have to stand for what he stood for, and as best they can, to do so by inviting him to take their life into his life, and walk with them. Knowing Christ is not about being able to use fancy, sophisticated theological language or being able to explain the historical context of scripture passages or any sort of formal education. Knowing Christ doesn't require you to know anything. He is completely open to everyone, regardless of their knowledge of the Bible or theology. He is accessible to us all. And knowing Jesus today, experiencing him here today and now, just requires that you're willing to live the way he lived and doing so in a position of openness and humility to him. We live in a beautiful reality where Jesus, Thomas's Lord and God, is just as accessible to us, just as knowable to us as he was to Thomas, who could see him and touch him. There once was a man named Frank Laubach, and he worked for many years as a missionary in the Philippines. And at the height of his career, they were starting a seminary, and they were having an election for president. It was going to be a career-making move for him, but out of chivalry, he decided to vote for his opponent. He lost the election by one vote, and it devastated his career. He hit rock bottom. And one day while climbing Signal Hill in the Philippines to go work with the Moros people whom he disdained and did not like, he heard God speaking to him, challenging him to love those people and work with them and have compassion on them. And in the moments and years that follow, Frank decided that he would make a game out of prayer. 
It was an experiment he called his game with minutes, where he tried to bring God to his attention, God's presence before his mind, once a minute, as long as he was awake. In devising this experiment, Frank wondered to himself, can I bring God back in my mind flow every few seconds so that God shall always be in my mind as an afterimage, shall always be one of the elements in every concept and precept? I choose to make the rest of my life an experiment. In this experiment, Frank discovered that his working daily life and his prayer life seamlessly blended into one. And to his surprise, he discovered that he was best aware of God's presence when he was working about his daily tasks with his mind turned towards God. He said, To know that I find thee best when I work listening, not when I am still or meditative or even on my knees in prayer, but when I work listening and cooperating. Frank dedicated himself to knowing God in his daily life, and he did some extraordinary things. He launched a global literacy movement, worked with presidents and world leaders, and developed the each one, teach one strategy you may have heard about. He did all of this while turning his attention to God throughout his working minutes. Another example involves a monk named Brother Lawrence, who lived at a monastery many centuries ago. Now, Brother Lawrence had a job at his monastery, as all monks do, but he was not in charge of preparing the prayers or organizing the library or any sort of wonderful, notable task. Brother Lawrence was a dishwasher. But he decided that in his dishwashing, he would work on being aware of God in every minute, and he called it practicing the presence of God. And he ended up writing a little book about it, which you can read. It's free on the internet if you're curious. But he decided that he would spend his life trying to be aware of God's presence in the middle of his daily tasks. And surprisingly, Brother Lawrence became one of the most notable people at this monastery. So people would travel to the monastery not to meet with the famous, well-studied priests, but to go into the kitchen and spend time with a dishwasher who was trying to be aware of God. This is what Dallas Willard was talking about when he said that knowing Christ is about knowing him interactively in the midst of your daily activities. As you wash the dishes, make beds, brush your teeth, do your schoolwork, answer emails, fix broken things, and change diapers, talk to your friends and neighbors, Christ is there. He wants to join you in your work and be a part of it. What if you could be like Frank Laubach or Brother Lawrence and work on turning your attention to God in the daily mundane moments of life? I encourage you this week to try Frank's Game With Minutes. As long as you are awake, try turning your attention to God, to Jesus, who are one and the same, every minute as long as you're awake. And see if you begin to see him interacting with you in your daily life. I don't think any of us will do this perfectly, and perfection is not the goal with any spiritual practice or discipline. Knowing Christ and recognizing him in daily life is our goal, just as Thomas did. Believing in Christ and coming to know him in our daily life will give us the abundant life in Jesus' name that is promised to us and will make us sons and daughters of God, aware of his activity and action in our world in the simplest moments of day-to-day living. This is what God wants from us, and it's what John wanted from us when he wrote his gospel. He wanted us to join in the work that Christ is doing in the world. And some of that happens in the grand moments and gestures of lives like people like Frank Laubach, who made a global change. But it also happens in the small, sacred, ordinary moments of having dinner with friends and our daily chores. We only have to be open to God to perceive him. And he will show us himself, just as he showed himself to Thomas. Please pray with me. God, thank you for being present and active in our world. And thank you for desiring a close, intimate life with us. May we learn to see you and recognize you in the middle of our lives and in the things we do daily. Please be with us as we go forth from here. Help us live life with you. 
We also ask that you use these gifts and offerings to further your kingdom, that you will help more people come to know you and live in the good and beautiful, abundant life you have promised. In your name we pray. Amen.